One of Colorado's largest school districts looks at closing schools tonight, how that squares with what we tend to think of as a growing population. Tax rebate checks are coming soon with a new strategy to redistribute wealth among Coloradans this year. The Secretary of State is being deceptive with donors. As she says she's fighting misinformation. We cannot seem to learn our lesson, and the bears are not going to learn it for us. So the task of keeping us separate just got more expensive. And we'll meet a young Coloradan comfortable in his own skin. And I'll show people my scar if it's like summer and tell them it's kind of like a superpower. All that is next. Seems all we hear is about how Colorado is growing, the metro area especially. So it's also jarring to see how Jeffco Schools, state's second largest school district, is talking tonight about closing school buildings, shutting down full schools because of a lack of students. Colorado's people person, the state demographer, told our Steve Steger that the 27,000 empty seats in Jeffco Schools should really challenge our assumptions about just how Colorado is growing. If it needed to, Jeffco Public Schools could serve about 96,000 students, but the problem is only 69,000 kids are currently in school there. And if trends continue, that number's only gonna shrink. For Colorado as a whole, we reached our peak school age population in 2018. And then we've been declining ever since. Jefferson County reached their peak in 2001. Colorado State Demographer Elizabeth Garner says it's really a statewide trend. We are starting to slow down in terms of our population growth, and most of it actually has to do with this slowdown in births. The last census showed as a state we gained about 38,000 people 18 and under in the last 10 years, but 43 of Colorado's 64 counties saw their population of kiddos drop. Those are the bluer counties on the map. Jefferson County is the bluest, losing about 5,200 people 18 years and younger since 2010. If you think about it in neighborhoods, you know, typically you move in, you have kids, they age, you age in place, you get to a point where you're not having kids anymore. Garner says there are plenty of reasons people aren't having as many kids. Daycare and other child-related costs are expensive. Birth control is better. So is education, leading a lot of people to pursue careers first and delay families. And none of this is to say that people aren't having kids. Those red counties have added more people 18 and up than Jeffco lost. Weld County, where we're seeing a lot of new development, was responsible for adding more than 16,000 new kids to the population. Remember how I said that people are having kids later in life? We might be about to see the benefit of that. So instead of having kids in their 20s, they're having kids in their 30s. Um, and our peak person is really aging into the 30s, so that we could start to see an increase. Colorado is one of the states that gained school age kids in the population. 27 states didn't. In fact, the U.S. lost about a million kids in that 18 and under range. So Garner says that we should be paying a lot of attention to that because states tend to get competitive. And if you're a state that lost kids, mm -hmm. you're worried about the future of your economy, you're going to start trying to lure people away, potentially who are about to have a family, and bring them in so that you can boost that population up. Interesting to hear that uh, the Lodo bros and ladies of years past are now settling down and having kids. We're kind of aging into this. And I guess uh, these things are going to happen. These demographic trends, you just don't want to be surprised because when you're surprised, all of a sudden you're like, how do I fill my schools? Yeah, there's nothing sh that Garner says we should worry about. We should just be aware. Be aware of what the community is like. That way we can plan for if we're going to have some economic issues relating to that slowed down growth. We just need to make sure that we're paying attention to this kind of stuff. Yeah, because it's not easy to pick up a school and move it to Weld County. No. They're going to need schools. Thank you, Steve. People affected by the Marshall Fire are now asking a judge to let a class action lawsuit against Excel continue. Companies trying to get the lawsuit tossed, in part saying it doesn't matter if they started the fire so long as Excel met state standards for its equipment. The lawsuit mentions this video showing sparks flying from a power line near the area where the Marshall Fire started. The lawsuit says that arcing power lines may have started that massive fire. Excel wants the lawsuit tossed because of what's called filed rate doctrine. Companies basically saying that its equipment complied with the standards set forth by state regulators. Excel referred to those 100 mile per hour winds as an act of God, so outside their control. Attorneys for the community members argue in their new filing that Excel cannot use that filed rate doctrine as a shield from liability. We're seven months past that fire. Investigators have not yet said definitively how they believe it started. 
Our usual summer storm season, you know, has been pretty quiet till it got rowdy today. CDOT cameras spotted this land spout out along 70 near Stratton and Burlington out by the Kansas border. This is about 430, closer to Denver. Garden's got a good taste of monsoon season. Uh, Noah Gray ready to build his ark in southeast Aurora today. Danielle Grant, a little spicy Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it certainly was, Kyle. Keeping me on my toes, that's for sure. Off to the eastern plains, off to the Denver metro area. It has been a day. As we look across the entire state, it is all lit up. Lots of lightning out there in the high country, and we still have that tornado warning going across the far eastern plains into Kit Carson, Cheyenne counties. That's going to last another about 15 minutes time, but at least it is south of I-70. That was really the biggest concern. Here around the Denver metro area, our storms are fizzling out. They rolled off the foothills with a vengeance and then kind of died off. Still some light rainfall around the Little Tenaria, Highlands Ranch, King Carroll too. As we look throughout the rest of the evening, the storms will focus across I-76 and I-70. This is late tonight, about 11 midnight. Everything moves out and early tomorrow morning. We'll start off with some sunshine and then here we go again. 3, 4 o'clock. Storms will be a bit more isolated here in Denver, but heavy rainfall coming through the San Juans, through Telluride, South Central Colorado, and then late tomorrow night, timeline 7 p.m. to about midnight, some pretty strong thunderstorms firing up once again. Again, across the far northeastern plains. Some damaging winds, large hail, that'll be the biggest threats tomorrow. Highs once again returning to the 90s here in the metro. A little cooler up in the mountains. And then finally, a better cool off for us here in Denver with highs in the 70s and a better chance for those monsoon storms moving in Thursday and Friday. But the 90 degree heat, oh yeah, it's back next week. I'm back, Danielle, thank you. Some of our Tabor refunds go out in the mail next month. $750 checks conveniently timed to arrive just before Election Day to get you feeling warm and fuzzy about the government. Now, normally you would get the Tabor refund next year when you do your taxes. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger explains why the election year change, supported by Colorado Democrats and a few Republicans, not only gives you the money now, but also changes how much you receive. I figured out a better way to explain Tabor than by using kids' blocks. Taboropoly. When the state takes in more money than allowed, we get Tabor refunds. Democrats, who normally hate Tabor, led the effort to get $750 sent back to Coloradans starting next month. Twice this much if you file your taxes jointly. Normally, we'd have to wait to file our taxes next year to get refunds through tax credits. I think what we have this year is going to work really well. It was also predicated on the need for, for moving quickly. Democratic uh, State Senator Chris Hansen helped get these direct mail refunds passed, which also alters how much we get between the direct check and next year's tax credits. Having the refund mechanism be more equitable, less regressive, uh, is, a, is the, a good outcome for this year. That means taking money from the rich to balance out how much we all get. If you file your taxes jointly, look for your income level as a couple and double the refund amounts I'm about to show you. For people who earn up to $47,000, you'll get $851. $750 of it will be in a direct check in the next two months. The other $101 will be a credit on your state taxes next year. That's $211 more than you would have received if the state did not do the direct checks. Income levels of 47000 and 95000 Between this year and next year, you'll get $885. That's $32 more than you would have without the direct check. Incomes of ninety-five dollars to $150,000, you'll get $905 between this year and next. But because of the direct check to everyone, you'll actually get 77 fewer dollars than you would have otherwise. Income levels of $150,000 to $208,000, you'll get $935. That's $232 fewer bucks. The next income level, you'll get $949. Because of the direct checks to everyone, that's really 307 fewer dollars than you would have received. And if you live on Park Place and Boardwalk, you'll get $1,069, but that's 951 fewer dollars than you were supposed to get. Coming soon to a store near you, Republican Senator Bob Rankin, who sits on the Joint Budget Committee with Senator Hansen, told me on the phone just a little bit ago, he's not for the equitable balancing of the money. He would rather see the state reduce the income tax, which in Tabor refund years means less refund and more that we kept prior to that. In non-Tabor refund years, it means the state took in less money. Hansen, who would rather see us do away with Tabor altogether and let the state keep and spend the money, since, since it's still here, though, he wants a higher earned income tax credit as a refund mechanism to help lower income earners every other year. 
Yeah, so I was curious about Marshall. Does this mean the Colorado Democrats don't want to kill Tabor anymore? They like they like it now. Now that it's that's a check you can send out ahead of election day. I, I can speak to one. Hansen told me he would still rather do away with Tabor and spend that money right now. K twelve higher ed. If you don't have to give it back, you can spend it on the state. If Tabor didn't exist, well. That conversation has been shelved for another year when inflation is not so high and the checks aren't rolling off the printer. Marshall, thank you. Colorado's election deniers who lost Republican primaries are not going away. Secretary of State candidate Tina Peters and Senate candidate Ron Hanks have both filed for recounts for a second time now, both again alleging without evidence the Denver-based Dominion voting systems could have stolen votes from them. And there are other election deniers who got blown out in their state legislative primaries who also want recounts, all three from down near Colorado Springs. Linda Zamora Wilson lost her state Senate race by a two-to-one margin, roughly the same margin for Carl Dent and Summer Grubert. All three are asking for recounts. The state will calculate how much that would cost. The Republican candidate for Secretary of State is not an election denier. Pam Anderson is, is anything but... She stood up to election lies in her own party. But you'd be forgiven if you were confused if you read the latest fundraising push from Democratic Secretary of State Janet Griswold, who's trying to round up cash by suggesting that her opponent is an election denier. Today's fundraising email tells supporters in bold text that election deniers got the majority of the votes cast in the Republican primary for Secretary of State. The email does not mention that the winning candidate in the three-way Republican primary is not an election denier. The fundraising pitch goes on to say, quote, we need to defeat the anti-democratic rhetoric and misinformation once and for all. Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold is on pretty shaky ground making misleading suggestions to donors while she's claiming to fight election misinformation. You know, even before former President Trump's big lie, we talked here about Secretary Griswold's decision to inject hyperpartisanship into the office that runs Colorado's elections, how that might not inspire confidence with voters. Secretary of State Griswold could be out celebrating right now the fact that her Republican opponent shares her belief that our elections are safe and secure. Instead, she's fundraising off some crafty wording that deceptively suggests that she's up against an election denier. The fundraising letter is factually accurate, but it's not consistent with someone who says that defeating misinformation is a top priority. The bears are getting bolder, or we're getting dumber, or both, so the state's going to spend more money to keep us separated. A young Coloradan shows off what makes him different. Most people think that it's a curse, but you, you don't want it to be a curse. Perspective. Pride next. The air we breathe on the front range does not meet federal health standards. Colorado is now out with the state's first look at its plan to improve it. The state struggled to meet the EPA's ozone standards. The EPA is expected to redesignate the front range from what's referred to as serious non-attainment to severe non-attainment, basically just like not good. Experts say we should be in compliance with a 2008 standard that sets, a pollution, that sets pollution at 75 parts per billion in an eight-hour exposure by the year 2027, but we're not expected to meet that tougher standard by the 2024 timeline. The state thinks that it can improve the situation by getting more electric vehicles on the road and phasing out gas-powered lawn equipment. State may also put in tougher regulations for all sorts of products. We're going to have tougher um, consumer products requirements. Those are emission, requir our emission um, requirements for architectural and industrial maintenance coatings, co consumer products, and, um, and other um, chemicals that are in um, almost every aspect of our life. They have to be lower emitting. Next up, the Regional Air Quality Council Board will vote on that plan, and then it must get the state's approval. You got bears getting into people's business more often, usually because we invite them in. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife is going to give a bunch of groups money so they can each try to figure out how to keep bears out of their area. There are 11 groups around the state getting grant money, trying different solutions to ease human bear conflicts. Most of this is common sense stuff. What we know already works. Buying bear safe trash cans. But groups in Durango and Boulder have an additional idea. They want the trash can, sure, but they're also going to use some of the money to pay for fruit gleaning programs so people can sign up to have somebody pick the excess fruit off the trees in their backyard so that hungry bears aren't drawn there for dinner. And then the fruit goes to places like food banks. What sets a young Coloradan apart is a point of pride. 
you should not think of it as like a curse or something. You should think of it as a gift. He asked that you hear him out about the disability that changed his life. And it's a sign warning you so you don't get done dirty. Next. The CDC figures about one in five adults in Colorado lives with some sort of disability. For a community that can sometimes be overlooked, July is marked on the calendar as a chance to celebrate. So during this Disability Pride Month, we get some perspective from a nine-year-old Colorado who says he views his disability as a gift. Yeah, Swimming at the pool and just goofing around. He is a nine-year-old who loves to do anything. He's got a paralyzed leg that he's had since he was seven months old, but it doesn't stop him from doing anything. My right leg would just float. But since I'm in physical therapy, I'm learning how to control it, so I'm kind of using my right leg. I wasn't aware until last year that July signifies Disability Pride Month. It's not being afraid of sharing their stories, what happened to them, having that pride. It could help by disabilities also not being in the dark. It's like disabilities need to get some respect too. And I'll show people my scar if it's like summer and tell them it's kind of like a superpower. You should not think of it as like a curse or something. You should think of it as a gift. You're a one in a unique person in your life and you should be happy about it. If you think on the negative side, then that means you'll have less trust in yourself. You want to have good friends, and they treat me like a perfectly good friend. This is Sharky. Mitchell found him at the bottom of the pool, and, and we've just known him the way he is for all of his life. So we don't think of Mitchell as having a disability. He's just been Mitchell. So now we're kind of like the best friends. Like they won't even mention my leg. They will just act like I'm a regular human. We should take that difference and make it into something that is great about that person. Justin Mitchell. That story came to us from our photojournalist Foster Gaines. Mitchell told Foster he wanted more people to know about the disability awareness flag. It has a black backdrop and five other colors. The black on the flag is for people with disabilities who are also victims of violence and abuse. Red on the flag represents physical disabilities, gold, cognitive and intellectual disabilities, white for undiagnosed or invisible disabilities, blue, psychiatric disabilities, and green, sensory disabilities. We appreciate Mitchell bringing it to our attention. It's a sign. Keep your mouth closed in certain situations. That and your feedback next. It's a sign to watch what you drink. The sign at Spangler Park in Longmont reads, area irrigated with ditch water, do not drink from shrinklers. Well, first off, thank you for that timely heads up on the ditch water. That sounds nasty. I'm also not certain what a shrinkler is, but I'm, I'm not sure that adding pee makes the water any more drinkable there. The next viewer, Mike Snodderly, spotted this sign for us. If you see one that's that good or better, tweet it to us with the hashtag HeyNext or email next at 9news.com. Uh, some feedback via text tonight. You said that Marshall had a great explanation with his Taboropoly example of our taxpayer bill of rights refunds. Texter says Marshall's awesome at explaining the political situation. I agree. I think he's the absolute best. Linda Seelum uh, tweets in tonight to say, stop with the hate for Jenna Griswold already. Linda, it's not hate to point out when uh, elected officials are making misleading or deceptive statements, especially when they're talking about fighting misinformation in the next breath. We'll see you next time.